Here in Tishosum, uh, the word Tishosum actually means milky waters from herring spawn. Slama Nation is located about five hours north of Vancouver, British Columbia. We're a small little community just north of the city of Powell River. We are no longer a preserve, we are a treaty nation. So we are on our plowman lands today in the village of Tishosum. It's about this time uh, of the year, beginning of March to the second week of March, the herring would spawn here in big numbers. So with the herring come, you know, all the other sea life that, uh, that comes along with that, including the whales, um, all the salmon, all the different other types of fish we have in our oceans. Um, not only that, but the land animals. My name is Drew Blaney. I am uh, the Culture and Heritage Manager here in Slama Nation. Aja Chepot, Kes Paul Atanan, to which Tesho Sam Slama. A long time ago, uh, when doing research through our Slime and Treaty Society, um, a couple of photos popped up of uh, the mortuary poles located on T Squat, which um, is now known as Powell River, but T-Squat is the name of it for us. This all started uh, for me when I was 16 years old. Uh, I was uh, one of the summer students for the nation and I took a job with the GIS department in the research uh, department of the Treaty Society. So my job was to interview elders and to um, add their voice and their stories to the mapping program that we had developed. Hi, my name is Eric Blaney and I come from the Tlaman Nation. Um, my traditional name is Tiapthot and it comes from my great, 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 great grandfather and uh, it's an ancestral name that was given to me uh, by my elders. Aja Chepot, Tiapthot Henry Bob, uh, the late Henry Bob, told me a story about T-Squat and he told me about mortuary poles that were located right across from the village site and he said, I want you to find those poles. He said, I know there's got to be evidence up in the hills. Um, so. Uh, for a couple of years, I took every chance I could get to go out there to hike the bluffs and uh, walk along the falls and uh, was never able to find anything other than shell midden um, and some historic evidence of our people uh, living in that area. I always carried that story uh, at the back of my mind and in 2014, um, this would have been about uh, four years later, five years later, uh, we got this picture from Bert Finnamore um, that was sent to him from a lady in Pennsylvania. And um, that lady, um, her father uh, was gifted a scrapbook and uh, this photo was in that scrapbook. And her father was one of the original contractors who came here in the early 1900s to build the mill. We've concluded that that picture was probably taken around the year 1910 or 1911. The timing of this um, was perfect for the discussions that we're having around T-Squat, around uh, the specific claim um, in that um, the photo clearly shows date and time, um, shows the longhouses in the background. What's really interesting is the rifles. So what I've been calling the picture is, is uh, like Jose's last stand, right? To me, it feels like they were armed. They were showing a picture of themselves saying, this is our land and we're not leaving. You know, we are armed. These are mortuary poles here. Like, how can you remove us from this village site? You can see a lean-to built here. 
which is kind of looks like a teepee and you can see the long houses behind them which looks to be about three houses and when you look down at the lake you can kind of see where the current shingle mill is and you look at the um so that's the feeling i get from this picture and um it couldn't be uh, a more stronger um image i think of you know the last few people that were left uh, at that village site um, and the feelings they must have had um, and then to understand the poles being removed and our people being removed here to Tishosum. at that time we just didn't know you know if these poles were were still standing there did they rot? Um, did they burn up in the fire of 1918? So there was a lot of questions regarding that. It wasn't until recently where we discovered that the, the poles were housed at the Museum of Anthropology in, in Vancouver on Musqueam territory. And they had been housed there since the 1950s. So over the years, we had gone to the, the Museum of Anthropology many, many times. And it just, you know, it slipped our minds, you know. Um, while we were there, um, and it could be the, uh, due to the fact that the poles were labeled as Stalo Nation poles. Um, we did an elders trip down to Museum of Anthropology back in 2022, I believe. Um, we had some grant funding from 2020 um, to take our elders down there on a trip. Um, due to COVID-19, we had to cancel that until 2022. We were given a tour of the museum and um, we were led into the chambers where all of the totem poles were. Right there in front of us were these, these two poles standing there welcoming us and uh, you know just standing there looking up at the poles you know we I, I knew I'd seen them before and um, so I, I got on my phone and I, I texted my brother and I said uh, do you have pictures of the, the poles of T-Squat? And he said, ah, uh, let me find them. And really bad cell reception in Museum of Anthropology. So when you're walking through, it's, it's like you have to, to fight for a bar everywhere you go. So we were led into that, uh, that back room where, where we had a couple of masks and a couple of paddles laying on the tables. And uh, sure enough, I got a little bit of cell reception, one little bar and um, ding, ding, ding. All these photos start popping up on my phone. and. I'm standing there, I'm looking at the, the photos of the totem poles on my, on my phone and sure enough it's the same two mortuary poles that are standing right there in the entrance of the Museum of Anthropology. I got a text message when I was at a hockey game and uh, he says, I found, the, I found them. I said, you found what? And then the next text that came in was the mortuary poles and I almost fell out of my seat. I'm standing there next to uh, Susan Rowley, who's the director of the Museum of Anthropology, and, uh, and I show her my phone, and we're both kind of looking at it, and immediately we both stop what we're doing, and we say, we gotta go take a look at those poles, and sure enough, it was the poles we've been looking for, for for decades, so. have uh, what looks to me like a gentleman and a lady and the lady is holding a baby to her chest so um, my thoughts are it could have been a family that had passed away together and these poles were carved to uh, mark their graves that was such a magical moment these poles uh, uh, mortuary poles have been here at the museum for a very long time and uh, it had always been a question as to their history. There had always been some questions surrounding. We had very poor documentation. Sure, such an amazing feeling. First of all, it was, you know, knowing that those poles were carved by our ancestors and, um, you know, they stood in our territory for, for how many years and, you know, if those poles could tell a story, what would they share with us? So there are many times where um, people have acquired works 
For example, if you went and purchased something on eBay or you purchased something from an auction house, you may not have that rich history. And so later on in life, when you're thinking about where something go should go and you decide that maybe a museum for the moment is the right home for it, then you don't have any information to transfer to us other than the date that you acquired it and how. And so in that case, we don't have that connection. So, you know, there are collections and pieces that we still don't know about that are out there. Um, and it just goes to show that I believe the ancestors are with us and the timing and the finding of these uh, was perfect, you know, as we enter into the T-Squat specific claim negotiations, um, you know, as the mill comes up for sale and we have an opportunity to purchase back uh, our original village site or regain control of that original village site. You know, we've had a back and forth relationship with museums, um, you know, since the beginning of time, right? You know, I share that a lot of things are taken from our territories without our consent. But, you know, on the other hand, um, you know, if the museums didn't um, take in these items, I think a lot of these items would have been lost to, to Mother Nature, right? So, you know, on one hand, you know, these items should be returned to their rightful home. But, you know, on the other hand, we are grateful that museums have kept our, our items safe, um, you know, all of these years. In the case of the uh, figures, that connection may have been there, but the person whose collection uh, they were a part of, uh, the Reverend Rayleigh, uh, much of the documentation surrounding his collection was lost after he passed away. So when the collection came here, it didn't come with, with much documentation. Well, it just goes to show um, more loss. You know, when um, Israel would Powell pushed to have the potlatch band, um, to have all of our ceremonial regalia and carvings uh, burnt. There was a massive fire in front of the church here in Tishosem where um, any ceremonial gear was, was burnt. Um, and you look through some of the journals of the early colonizers and priests who profited. You know, they took, they cherry picked some of the nicest items and they sold them to museums or collectors uh, throughout the province and throughout the world. It's just been a, a truly amazing journey for, for me personally, but you know, for the whole nation, right? Um, we were impacted really hard here by colonialism. You know, so we didn't have much to go by over the years. What did our ancient um, carvings look like? Um, now we, you know, have a clue as to what, you know, the mortuary poles of that time looked like. So it gives us a big, um, you know, clue as to, you know, it, it, into our history. It gives us a lens into our history so that we could uh, be able to see it firsthand. So, you know, it's been truly amazing to, to be able to, um, you know, to bring, find those. So, you know, there are collections and pieces that we still don't know about that are out there. It's like a whisper in your ear from Henry Bob, you know, just to keep pushing because uh, things are out there, evidence is there, it will come to you. Um, so I think that's kind of what I've learned uh, through this process um, is that we will get our things back. You know, um, we are uh, on a quest to find our identity, to find our culture, to understand more about it. Um, and uh, you just got to keep pushing. The plan is to have them housed in our new cultural center. Uh, we broke ground on our cultural center, which is called Ums Aya. Uh, we broke ground uh, two weeks ago um, entering a, a blessing ceremony. So it's going to have a small little museum space where we would uh, ideally house all of our cultural items that return home to us. You all know we are here to break ground for Ums Aya. And the goal is to bring them home. So we've, um, you know, we've had talks with the museum so far. We haven't initiated the process yet formally to bring them home, but we know that's the goal at the end of the day is we want them to come home. Oh.